Moderna and BioNTech have been the front runners in the race to fight the coronavirus. Um, both of these platforms use the mRNA uh, vaccine base to create their vaccine. And what they've demonstrated that their platform is both fast and has the ability to um, give a very high success rate, both of them giving around 94, 95% um, activity, which is quite impressive. Um, the main difference is the platform, how they designed it. So the Moderna vaccine uses uh, the original Wuhan DNA um, to create mRNA. And one advantage it has over the BioNTech uh, vaccine is that its lipid base um, allows it to be stored at a bit higher temperatures. So the normal freezing temperatures you might uh, transport food in. The difference between the BioNTech one is that they actually also use the DNA from the Wuhan virus, but they take it a bit a step further. They've actually created some pseudoviruses. So they've used computer modeling to predict where um, mutations could occur. And they've made um, some pseudoviruses just in case that the virus mutates, they, their vaccine would still be viable. And those are the two main differences they've used to fight the COVID-19. The big question is, which one of these vaccines will survive to the end of this year and be able to deal with mutated strains? For Moderna, the COVID-19 will be their first big success story. Many of the critics uh, when they first came uh, to light were com compared them to Theranos a company with great promises, but little to show for it. Well, I guess the um, the fact that they pro created a COVID-19 vaccine uh, at breakneck speed um, sort of um, exonerates them from that title. The one thing that I will note though, I would say Stephen Bensell and Dr. Telzax are more adventure capitalists rather than you know, groundbreaking scientists. They're more like the visionaries of the team uh, uh, and provide business direction rather than the people who develop the vaccine themselves. I'm sure they have uh, great leadership skills and things like that, but they are basically the spokesperson rather than spokespeople, uh, the business people of the company rather than the people who um, perhaps make all these vaccines and vaccine decisions. I mean, you need people like that in business and, and it doesn't take away from anything that they've done. And I think they've done a great job so far. I mean, there are some controversies in regards to their insider trading activity and the manipulation of the price. But, you know, um, that's aside from anything to do with the vaccine itself, though. BioNTech has a team of scientific rock stars, I would say. I'd like to begin with the person which I believe is critical to their vaccine team, but it's just been ignored by the news and the media. Um, her name is Catalina Corioco. I believe she deserves the Nobel Prize for her pioneering work in RNA-mediated immune activation. If it wasn't for her and her work, uh, I don't believe the companies BioNTech and Moderna would even exist. She um, pioneered the work about lipid technologies and being able to activate um, mRNA in cell nucleuses. She was uh, the person who basically laid the foundation for these future vaccines to occur. Without her hard work in 1995, in 2021, we would not have a vaccine that was RNA based, which at the moment looks like the most effective vaccines that have ever been created. Now, along with her, her bosses, Ugo Sahin and Aslam Turiki, they're rock stars as well. They created a company called Ganymed in 2001, and their first drug they created was an absolute blockbuster. It was called Extandy for prostate cancer. They went to sell that uh, drug to um, Astellas Pharma, and they netted a nice $4.1 billion. Like a normal person would take that $4.1 billion and say, look, I've done my uh, bit for science and for humanity and probably just relax and take it easy. No, but not this, these two. What they decided to do is let's use this money to create cures for cancer. I mean, and also cures for things that 
were extremely difficult to treat like HIV and the herpes uh, virus and in fact they've actually gone very far with this with the University of Pennsylvania they have really um, successfully demonstrated that their vaccine is quite effective and in animal models they've got a 98 percent effect uh, effectiveness for uh, vaginal herpes now also with that they've got a melanoma vaccine which is stage three and they have now um, also are their front runners with their with their uh, Pfizer vaccine or BioNTech vaccine uh, because of this, this the size of the company they've had to shoulder get some help through uh, BioNTech uh, through Pfizer and also for another company called Fuzon which is a Chinese um, multinational company that uh, delivers drugs and other pharmaceutical goods So Moderna and how they developed the vaccine. So what they did is they were able to get um, a computer sequence of the DNA uh, of the coronavirus and they modeled their vaccine on the um, spike protein. They then used this to uh, create that spike protein, encapsulate it in their um, patent and lipo, lipid um, uh, encapsulation uh, and then create this spike which was able to show early on that it had an effect on animal models and they learned from stage one two and currently stage three um, what's particularly good about their vaccine which makes it quite outstanding is that its storage temperature uh, allows it to be transported at negative 20 degrees um, which is like the normal uh, freezing temperature you would say transport fish or other frozen goods and it does give it somewhat of an advantage over um, BioNTech for that reason. Now, BioNTech follows a similar path um, on their development. They basically got the DNA sequence on a computer model uh, and they created the mRNA from the Wuhan strain using the spike protein. But they took it one step further. They were not happy just to get a mRNA that was active against the Wuhan strain they modeled it against not 19 other pseudoviruses so they not only made sure that it would be effective for the Wuhan strain they would made went on to make sure it was effective in mutated strains so they chose 19 different uh, types of pseudoviruses and they also had 20 vaccine candidates before they found the one this is really really smart so not only did they um, look at the original strain, they went and did 20 pseudoviruses. They actually trialed 20 different vaccines until they narrowed it down to the one that they're currently using, which is really forward thinking, I believe. So let's talk about the Moderna immune response. So what we do know about the Moderna immune response, it's mainly neutralizing antibodies and the CD4 count. Um, and that's pretty good. Neutralizing antibodies are what they call sterilizing immunity. The only issue with neutralizing antibodies, if they come from memory B cells, they tend to hamper cellular immunity. But one thing that this vaccine has that the Oxford vaccine doesn't have is also a CD4 count. CD4 counts are actually important for um, memory um, cells. Um, so that is pretty good there is one very bad thing though that we've noticed um, about it and this was published in Forbes by a distinguished scientist called William A. Hayesline um, and he gives a scathing review against uh, Moderna basically because you can see a dramatic reduction at um, 119 days that the uh, vaccine starts to fall dramatically in its efficacy um, that could mean that uh, this vaccine will only last for four months. So if that's the case, then people will require three vaccinations of Moderna per annum. I think for the layperson, that might be too much. So there is a problem with Moderna, mainly because of the efficacy of the vaccine doesn't seem to be long lasting. Um, and unfortunately for them, uh, I think BioNTech is long lasting. And it's the different of approach on the immune response that creates that. And I'll cover that in the next slide.
Now, the difference in the immune response um, of the BioNTech vaccine is that it stimulates CD4, CD8, Th1 cells, and inevitably, I would believe, would have a very big cascade effect on memory B cells. Now, memory B cells are important to create a long-lasting immunity. We see these in vaccines like polio, which give you two, three years, and even lifetime immunities. This is really, really good. Now, they took it to another level uh, to make sure that their vaccine would um, last very, very long. They basically created 19 pseudoviruses uh, and they used the mRNA, which would combat them, and integrated that into their vaccine to give it that long lasting effect. Um, so, not only does it have this cascade reaction uh, with long lasting immunity through CD8 and CD4 counts, um, it also uh, is future proof by the fact that it's been modelled against a total of 20 viruses, the Wuhan and 19 pseudoviruses. So it should give us a long lasting effect. So I've got this um, Moderna results from the FDA submission, um, and that was used to determine whether they would give it the AK okay or not. Now, I think the results are really impressive here. Um, you see a 94.5% overall. Uh, between 18 and 65, we got a 93.4%, and from 65 years and older, 100%. Um, sample sizes are pretty good. Um, the only issue, I believe, is that they should have gone a little bit further and broke it up between 70 um, and 75, 80 and 85, 90, 95, etc. Um, but still, the results are pretty good. Um, the only uh, problem here, I guess, is that they really haven't tested children. Um, Pfizer has, and I know they are looking at testing children uh, for future uh, vaccines. So that's yet to be seen, but so far so good. So with the Pfizer efficacy, uh, it's equally good, if not better. And when I say why it's better, it's simply because they've looked at younger age groups and in the younger age group between 16 and 17 it's 100 percent effective however i would say the sample size is quite small um, i would have hoped for a bigger sample size but i guess it's very difficult to recruit young people in, in a vaccine study um, 18 to 64 we get 94.6 uh, 65 to 74 92.9 and greater than 70 uh, 75 100 percent efficacy um, I guess, you know, that's pretty, that's a really good result. Um, and in comparison to um, Moderna, it's much of a muchness, really, I would say. At the moment, the world is fearing South Africa and the strain that's coming from there. Basically, South Africa is crying for vaccines because they've not been given much love by the vaccine companies because they're not one of the richest countries in the world. And in fact, Moderna um, and Oxford have refused to actually supply Africa with vaccines. And I believe it's out of fear, not because they um, uh, don't want to be uh, kind to Africa, but I think they fear that if they did give their vaccine, it would fail in Africa because they never designed it for mutations. But BioNTech and Pfizer have taken that step to actually provide um, African healthcare workers vaccines. And they do plan to roll up the vaccine at a discounted price to Africa. The brave move, I believe, is the confidence they have in their vaccine because they have future proofed it. So the thing that I believe that makes the BioNTech the ultimate winner in this uh, ra uh, you know, race between the two vaccines is that the fact that they have created pseudovirus uh, neutralizing, neutralizing titers, um, which means they basically, they've kind of proven that their vaccine works against mutations. Now, this is really important. We're now realizing this Wuhan COVID-19 rapidly is mutating. And we've got like two or three really um, scary um, mutations around. We have the mink mutation, we have the UK mutation, and we have the South African mutation, which is really, really rapidly spreading out.
Now, I think this has created a lot of fear for um, companies like Moderna and Oxford, but I, I don't see the same fear with BioNTech. In fact, Uri Sahane said, you know, he does believe it's going to work, but within two weeks, he'll be able to definitively say yes. And for some reason, it's not as efficacious as he wanted it to be. It would take him six weeks to modify this vaccine, which I truly believe is the case. And I don't think that well, there'll, be, there'll be so much of a requirement of modification because of the high initial efficacy rate. Um, I think Moderna more so will have an issue because if you look at the two different vaccine platforms, um, they actually use three times the concentration in the Moderna vaccine to elicit the immune response. And that means a lot actually because you're saying that um, you don't need that much for BioNTech because it's more uh, directed uh, so it's not concentration driven it's more that it creates uh, multiple attachment points to the spike protein um, and I think that does give it a bit of an edge against all its competitors um, and they do have a head start because they have been you know researching cancer um, vaccine for years and years and we know cancers mutate a lot uh, and they've used this knowledge about mutation to devise a COVID vaccine which has given them an edge over Moderna and every other vaccine that will come forth from here, here on in. In terms of religious acceptance, both uh, Moderna and BioNTech vaccines are religiously acceptable to Muslims and Catholics. The reason is it's not based on fetal cells and the contents of the vial would be considered halal to all Muslims. Uh, so in terms of ethics, these vaccines don't have a problem uh, like the Oxford vaccine. And I think it'd be widely accepted uh, by Muslims and Catholics and other religions around the world. The only question is which vaccine is gonna last throughout the year and which vaccine is going to be able to survive multiple mutations. I believe BioNTech is that candidate and one thing they have just alluded to is that they're about to make a lyophilized version of their vaccine. This means a powder version that doesn't require special freezing requirements. So if Pfizer brings out a powder vaccine, it's all over for every other vaccine company because then they will have the vaccine with the highest efficacy rate, uh, the highest ability to deal with mutations, and also a vaccine that is easily stored. It will really be game over for every other vaccine company. They might survive this year, but you won't see them in 2022 if they're able to do so.